story without a reason, without a rhyme. Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole video, we're gonna look at, um, another chapter, really. There's another one of those, uh, screen movies coming out pretty soon. So I think it's a good time to take a look at this. In this old one, we're going to Gainesville to look at a story that would lead to many more of the fictional kind. The inspiration for the Scream movies. Ooh. And there were a few of those here. A quote-unquote musician was up to no good as usual. He was a gas man. Uh, well, okay, no, not really. But it's one hell of a story. Emphasis on hell. Let's give it a go. The year 1990, a fine vintage. The place? Florida. Because, duh, where else would it be? It's getting embarrassing. Northern, Nordy Florida, to be precise. Gainesville. I think there's something about getting them gains in Gainesville, but I made that joke already. Fuck it, I'm making it again. Anyways, in beautiful Gainesville, I haven't been there. Maybe it's a dump, I'm being kind. There lies a university. The University of Florida, that is. It actually does look very beautiful, to be fair. No, uh... Real high rises, lots of woods, perfect to, uh, well, you know, sneak around, covert like. The population of Gainesville City in the year 1990 was about 92,000. By the way, I just noticed that recently I've been covering a lot of stories from the 90s. What's up with that? The number of students was not far off half that. Big schoolio. It's a great university. You might say it's one of the best. And if you want to learn engineering, it's a good place to do that. Ghostface over here thought it would be a good place to do something else. That's something else, big something something. Began in August... 1990. Students were beginning to congregate back in Gainesville, getting ready for the start of semester. The town, it went from ghost town to, uh... You know, not that, as kids poured in. The weather, it'd be muggy, hot, sweaty. Not for me, but you know what it leads to a lot of people leaving the windows open. A lot of those, um, you know, serial killer tropes, they come from right here. Sonia Larson and Christina Powell were two of those students, having just recently arrived in Gainesville to start their fir very first semester. Sonia and Christina, both undergrads, both 17 years old, well, it was their first year. They met over the summer and decided to room together at the university. Well, they were actually in an apartment off campus. No room at the inn, as it were. And so, Williamsburg Apartments was where they were to be, a short walk from the main campus. They moved into that apartment on the 23rd of August 1990, as the autumn semester was beginning. They wouldn't stay any longer than that. Literally, the night they moved in, he came in. On Saturday, the 25th, family of Christina's arrived with furniture and bits and bobs to help with the move. And there was no answer to their knocking. No one could get through to them. Notes had been left by other students on their door. It seemed like there, were just, there was just no activity at all. Eventually, on the Sunday, her family, starting to a little worry, they contacted the maintenance guy. You know, get your arse over here, kick that door down. He called the police at 4 p.m. Already, they were suspecting something, you know. I was wondering if it would be possible for me to have an officer to meet me. Okay, what's the problem there? I have two girls. The parents uh, suspected that something's wrong with them, or they've disappeared or something. I'm just not sure, and my manager informs me not to go in by myself, but okay. to be accompanied by a police officer. Oh, okay, go ahead. We're here for my me too. When they got in and started snooping around, um, the maintenance guy, he legged it down the stairs and started puking. Christina Powell, she was downstairs. She had been sexually assaulted, stabbed to death, and mutilated. Sonia was upstairs, stabbed to death. She had defensive wounds, she had tried to fight him off. Both had been posed in sexual positions, both naked. It appeared that the door had been busted in with a screwdriver, and they were attacked, likely, while sleeping.
It was a, um, well, you might say it's gruesome. I would. Uh, sh- you shocking, shocking way to start the autumn semester. You know, word that when you're on campus like that. A, uh, you know. Holy shit. Moment. As you can imagine. Who would, could, do what had been done to them? Like, thousands and thousands of students were pouring into the town. What? Well, a lot of young partying students here for a good time! Was one of them a headbanger who would just gruesomely murder two other students? People didn't actually have much time to, to think about it, uh, though, uh, because it happened again right away. On Sunday the 25th, just a couple of hours after Sonia and Christina were found, another victim was found. 18-year-old Krista Hoyt. Krista was studying to become a cop. She wasn't an attendee of the University of Florida. She went to Santa Fe Community College, also in Gainesville, and was working part-time at the Sheriff's Office. In fact, she was supposed to be working at the Sheriff's Office that night, and she never showed. So two officers went to her house to see what the crack was. And, well, Krista was found in her bedroom, on her bed. She had been decapitated. Her head was on a shelf, staring at her body. Her body mutilated, naked, and sitting on the bed. They would later learn that the killer had murdered her after abusing her, left, and then returned to the scene of the crime before it was discovered, and then beheaded her. Some, um, sick shit. There were obvious links between the two murder scenes, right? Screwdriver had been used to break in. They had been stabbed to death. They had been posed. They had been sexually assaulted. And both of them had been, or all three of them, had been bound with uh, duct tape, right? And then after he did what he did, he would take the duct tape off him so that there was no evidence left behind. And so, you know, in the space of a weekend, they had three young women, all murdered students, brutally murdered. With no, it just seemed like a home invasion or something. Serial killer. Gladstone. The student body began freaking out. Now, with three murders in two days, a lot of students left, went home. People were calling on school to be postponed. Students were huddling together, sleeping together. No one, uh, no one wanted to be alone, I'll tell you that. And let me say, this guy, whoever he was, was busy. That very same weekend, right, a bank robbery was reported. A guy came in, ski mask, handgun, and robbed a bank in Gainesville. One of the tellers, though, managed to slip a red dye pack into the money bag, which exploded. A person later called into the police, saying they saw a suspicious person walking into the woods. The police followed, and in the woods, they didn't find this lad, but they did find the money covered in red. And a campsite. They found the gun, the mask, a screwdriver, and a tape player tape inside. They bagged up all the evidence, um... But before they even had time, you know, to do a moment, have a momentary goo. He struck again. Manny Taboda and Tracy Paulas were roomies, both 23 years old, both attending the university. On Tuesday, they were discovered in their apartment, at Gator Woods Apartments. Once again, maybe a 10-minute walk from the central campus at the University of Florida. Once again, the killer broke in with a screwdriver, found Manny asleep, stabbed him, which actually woke Manny up, so he fought back, and Manny was a big, strong guy. Then Tracy, hearing the noises, went to see what's up. Saw Manny and the killer fighting. She then ran and locked herself in her bedroom. Manny was killed, and the door was broken through. Tracy asked before it was if he was the guy, and he said he was. Tracy was then bound, assaulted, and stabbed to death. She was posed. Manny wasn't. So, over the course of a long, a long weekend, five students were brutally murdered in their home in this college town, where that, you know, it doesn't, that doesn't happen. This uh, quickly spiraled into national, even global, news. Mad shit. Everyone was fearful, and for a time there were probably more reporters than there were students. This was all over the news. Reporters even tried and maybe did, wink wink, bribe police for info to get the inside scoop. And one person happened to see a bit of this news. 
Okay, well actually he happened to see a documentary four years later, but it was about this, right? And his name was Kevin Williamson, and him watching this documentary about who would later be called the Gainesville Ripper led him to create this lad. The story of the Gainesville Ripper was it would turn out to be you know, the inspiration for Scream. Kevin Williamson, he saw a documentary about the Gainesville Ripper and he was thinking about an open window in his own home while he was watching it. And then the idea of a man, person, just randomly breaking into people's houses, college students' houses, you know, gruesomely stabbing them to death. I mean, it's... It, it's this! One of the original drafts of Scream, well, was a scary movie, became Scream. It was set on a college campus, which of course they say then for Scary Movie 2. So there's a fun fact for you and a, uh... Uh, not, not so fun story, so, um, oh, I guess we should, uh, move on. Soon, they had their man. Or thought they did. A guy named Edward Humphrey, freshman student, well, an officer with the Gainesville Police Department reported him as suspicious. And this officer wasn't the only one. Edward, uh, gotta love him. He kind of looked like a serial killer due to the scars on his face. They were the result of a car accident he had been in. He also had a history of uh, mental illness, he didn't take his medication, and he had been violent on more than one occasion. He even carried around a knife. It was a pen knife. It's a knife though. They began to surveil him on the 28th of August. Then, on the 30th of August, just you know, a couple of days after the double homicide, uh, he was arrested. Edward Humphrey was arrested. He was actually arrested for assaulting his grandmother, and the cops publicly named him their numero uno uh, suspecto. The police had a few suspects, but only his name was ever made public. There was no evidence linking him to any of the murders, but they didn't let that stop them from getting warrants for everything they could, and finding sweet F all. But the murders, you know, they did stop after he was arrested, right? So, you know, maybe? And after that, things uh, began to kind of quieting down, you know, college, college life kind of regained its normalcy and people started to get back, you know, on track, on with their lives, on with culture. I mean, they thought they had the guy. No one else was killed. Or were they? No, I don't know why I said that. They did have bodily fluids from the perp, left behind. But back in the day, DNA, you know, it wasn't exactly like it is now. They were able to get the blood type though from the fluids, and the killer had type B blood. Eddie had type A. But that, um, it didn't matter to some. Not all. Then, as word spread around the various PDs across the country as to, you know, the type of crime and all that, well, 800 miles away in Shreveport, Northwest Louisiana, police noticed something. You gotta be shitting me. How the victims were killed in Gainesville, right? It was remarkably similar to a crime they had in Shreveport. A November 1989 triple homicide. A grandfather, daughter, and grandson had been the victims of a home invasion while preparing dinner. 55-year-old William Grissom, his 24-year-old daughter Julie, and 8-year-old Sean had all been killed. Julie's body had been mutilated and posed, just like the four women in Florida. An investigator from Florida went to talk to detectives there in November 1990, and noted that, well, it had to have been done by the same guy. Everything was the same right down to the duct tape that was used and then taken with him. They also found bodily fluids and blood that matched the type B found in Gainesville. A couple of weeks later, uh, the police got a ring ring. A woman from Shreveport, a woman named Cindy Jurisic, she called up the old, uh, what should we call them? Crime Stoppers. Those lads. She thought that she might know who was behind it. She had met a guy back in church when they were, you know, having a bit of an elk parade in Louisiana, right? And she thought he was fucking bad shit. One of those. A weirdo, right? And her husband had thought the very same thing about him. Watch that, lad. He's up to no good. And they got a, they got a lot of this and they were like, oh, we can't be around this lad anymore. He's a T-R-O-U-B-L-E. Trouble. Yeah, that. Because he said he had a problem. His problem was, you know, not like, um, I don't know, normal problems. His problem was that he liked to stab people. I would, I would agree that that's probably a problem. 
His name was Danny Rollin. I'm about to change the pace here, or I need a job. That's the one you and I, you and I wrote, Mom, out in the front yard, remember? Danny was from Shreveport, born in 1954. He had one younger brother, Kevin, and one hell of an abusive father, James, a cop, who bet the shite out of, um, well, everybody. A real bastard, right? Danny's mother, Claudia, she would take the kids and try and leave again and again and again and again, and just like that, be lured back by false promises much the same. Definitely a house of fear. James would beat his wife, he would beat his kids if they didn't sit properly at dinner, if they held their cutlery not the way he liked it, if they breathed weird. Yeah, growing up, Danny tried to kill himself a couple of times, didn't. Uh, then he joined the Air Force, was discharged pretty quickly because of drugs and alcohol issues. He was married, had a kid, then had a divorce, and then just kind of became a bank robber. He was arrested for armed robbery multiple times, ending back home each time with Ma and Pa. Each time he tried to find work, he'd fail to keep it. Two months was the longest employment he had. In November 1990, he murdered the Grissoms, who lived less than a mile from the Rawlings. Things came to a head in the Rawling home when James and Danny, Danny was a big boy at this stage, uh, they got into an argument. Right, and basically Danny, you know, James, they were fighting and at one point Danny basically went to his dad, James, and said, do something, do something, pussy. James did. He got a gun. After a bit of a scuffle, uh, the gun ended up in Dan's hands and he shot James in the head. And then he fled. James would survive, minus one of these. And so Dan ran. Ending up in Gainesville. Camping out in the woods. Now remember that tape the uh, police found at the camp? Well, that that was Danny's. He he fancied himself, but it was something of a singer songwriter. He dreamed of becoming a country country music star. And in August 1990, he recorded an album's worth of eh, pure shite. Let's be let's be honest. This was very not very long before he would murder five students. Randomly just breaking into their homes in the middle of the night and doing horrific things to them. I don't know. I, I don't know what people think anymore. All I know is I'm just one man alone in this world, facing the whole world by himself. And no matter what anybody thinks about man, Danny Harold Rowe, no matter what happens in the road ahead of me, at least I'll walk it as a man. I know the judgments of men and how it stinks. Man does not judge rightfully. Well, I know I have to run the rest of my life. But I'm getting pretty good at it. If that means anything. I'm going to sign off for a little bit. That's something i got to do. So the police, they went looking for him. They didn't have to look uh, too hard though. He was already in jail. He had tried to rob a supermarket in early September in Ocala, and so he wasn't going anywhere. His blood was then matched to the type they already had. He pled not guilty to the five counts of murder. In Florida State Prison, uh, while awaiting trial, Danny met up with another prisoner named Bobby Lewis. And it was, was Delira, right? To tell Bobby pretty much everyone, right? He would tell Bobby, obviously, you know, only things that the killer would know. And then he would get Bobby to write letters to the police, basically like confessing true Bobby, because he didn't want to really confess, but he did want to. Here's a clip, right? It's an interview where Danny speaks to the police true Bobby, confessing everything. But Danny himself doesn't like really speak about it. Audio is shite, but you can see Danny whispering in Bobby's ear. Okay. Uh, do you remember 
They learned everything about the murders, how they were carefully planned, and everything he did to the victims. Including that, after he murdered Krista, he thought he had left his wallet at her house. So he went back, and while he was there, he cut her head off. Danny said he had multiple personalities. There was Danny the nice guy, Enad the bad guy, which is just Danny backwards, and Gemini, ooh, the evil guy, who made him do what he did. No one, uh... He's thinking of his bought that shit. It also kind of turned out that, whoa, that's sort of the plot of the movie The Exorcist Tree. He has found a haven. Come to take a little blood from your father. Which just happened to be playing in prison while Danny was there, right? He didn't admit to the Shreveport murders, though. Ed Humphrey was freed from prison. He was no longer a suspect in the murders. And so, the trial of Danny Rowling got closer and closer. And while he was waiting about for that to happen, he fell in love with a true crime author named Sandra London. Wow, it's a bizarre story. Sandra London is a colorful and bright woman, intelligent, talented, and it's a shame the way the media has bashed her as of late. She hasn't done anything to deserve that. Sandra is a worthy soul who only tries to bring the very best out of all she does. Is it true that you had anything to do with the murders at all? Oh, I still got the sign, do Here he is serenading her. Please, the court. Could I address the court? Sure, say whatever you want to say. Thank you. Sandra. Someone said to me, you can't run from your shadow. And all you want to be deep for shallow. Okay, excuse me, Mr. Ron. Down the path you choose, Mr. Ron. to follow, Mr. Ron. Tell me, baby, what were my words? All my tears run together. Yikes. And a uh, word to the wise that's not the first romantic relationship Sandra London has had with a serial killer while they were in prison. Less that's said about her, the better. Let's move on. May I please go over, yes, On July 18th, 1990, Danny Harold Rowling walked into an Army Navy store. It was in Tallahassee, Florida. It was near the bus station. He made a purchase. He paid about $34 plus tax. He bought an item. The item he purchased was a Marine Corps K-Bar knife just like this one. In a very real sense, that was the first step in a plan that became an episode that will forever be remembered as the Gainesville student murders. It resulted in the deaths as a result of the rampage of Danny Harrell Rowling of five people young students in this community. But as to Sonia Larson, the aggravation is massive. As to Christine Mal, the aggravation is massive. As to Crystal Hoyt, the aggravation is massive. As to Manuel Tabota, the aggravation is massive. As to Tracy Paulus, the aggravation is massive. Weighed so heavily in favor of the death penalty that he has earned. But it will be your duty to go through that weighing process and to make that recommendation to his honor for a sentencing recommendation while he has explained to you that he gives great weight to you. Two, what we're asking is, as you render a verdict to Judge Morris, that puts Mr. Rowling in a cell, you close the door, you take the key, you lock it, and you throw the key away. That's what we're asking for. The trial began in February 1994. Danny pled guilty, but the trial went ahead, as this was a death penalty trial. In March, the jury came to its decision. Death for Danny. As to the count one of the indictment, the first degree murder of Christina Powell, the majority of the jury, by a vote of 12 to zero, advised and recommend to the court that it impose the death penalty upon death Danny Harrell Rawling. As to count two of the indictment, the first degree murder of Sonia Larson, 
a majority of the jury, by a vote of 12 to 0, advise and recommend to the court that it impose the death penalty upon Danny Harold Rowling. As to count three of the indictment, the first degree murder of Christi uh, Krista Hoyt, a majority of the jury, by a vote of 12 to 0, advise. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, there's much I'd like to say, Your Honor, uh, about our world, my beliefs, and the destiny of man. However, I feel whatever I might have to say at this moment is overshadowed by the suffering I've caused. I regret with all my heart what my hand has done. For I have taken what I cannot return. If only I could bend back the hands on that ageless clock and change the past. Ah, uh, but alas, I am not the keeper of time, only a small part of history and the legacy of mankind's fall from grace. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Mm, get off the stage. Order that no one is to move in the courtroom until Mr. Rawling has been removed by the Division of Corrections. Five years. You're going down to five. Understand that? In less than five years. Mr. Uh, Snowden, remove Mr. Tobota from the courtroom, please, sir. You. Hey, Mr. Tobota, please remove yourself from the courtroom, sir. Please. Justice is please. Falling. False. We have the last say. We will prevail. Our children's names will be remembered over him. I will ridicule him. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry for that. Other than that, the, the proceedings have been done, I think, appropriately. Danny Rawling later did confess to the Shreveport murders. So, that means he killed eight people altogether and attempted to kill his dad. And before he was executed on the 25th of October 2006, he had lobster tail as his last meal. He sang a gospel song as he walked into the chair and died via lethal injection. And so ends the story of the Gainesville Ripper. I wanted to cover this story because it's not he's not necessarily one of the more better known serial killers out there, but I think he's probably one of the more influential. He's a scary motherfucker to boot. He killed just because he could. You know, at trial there was like a multiple personalities thing and you know, came up about his childhood, which, you know, would certainly play a part in making him who he was, but not the whole thing. He just did it because he wanted to, you know, and he carefully planned it all out. That's the story of the real ghost face killer, I think a lot scarier uh, than, you know, those lads from the Scream movies and all that. He just killed because he could, and he wanted to, and he did. He also made some shit music. Thank you so much for watching. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me and watching this whole video. Uh, here, go on. I'll see you as always real soon in the next little one. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Because I'll be it. Okay. Oh. Sweating.